Have you experienced grace? Moments of grace. Times when you're clear beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are loved, supported, that there is so much more to life than we generally stop to experience. Where you pause to wonder, how is it that I get to feel this, breathe this, receive this? In unity metaphysics, we call grace that unearned good. The good that comes not because you're trying, not because you're a good person, not because you're applying the law, not because you're watching your thoughts, not because you're taking mindful and skillful action, not because you're practicing forgiveness or compassion or kindness. It's the unearned good. I didn't know what to do with that. <laughs> so I danced to it, whatever, I don't know. Um, that was not a moment of grace for me. <laughs> We're here together in this moment. But those times when you really get it, that it, it's a gift. That something that just happened is an amazing and miraculous gift. And maybe in that moment you had an idea that we were wondrously made. That there was something else going on in the universe moving in and through and as us that made this mystical moment happen. But you were probably keenly aware that there's nothing that you could actually do to spark another one or to get more of that. In fact, sometimes with grace, the more you try to seek it, the more elusive it is. We are on the end of the journey. We have one more week of the book, Living from the Mountaintop, Be the Mystic You Were Born to Be by Christian Sorensen. Every fall, we dive into an adventure in spirituality and we engage in small groups or online discussions. We have a study guide online. But we read a book together, and we just allow it to have its way with us. And this book is about mysticism, and this week is about the soul's journey, soul sight, soul awakening, and grace. It's about the grace experience. So begin to allow yourself to open up to the times in life where you have truly felt grace. In this book, Christian Sorensen refers to grace as this. He says, the grace experience is not a mental one, nor an intellectual one, but rather it is an experience of the soul. Your spirit can know grace, but only through a direct encounter with it. You can learn about other people's grace-filled mystical moments. You can even closely study the steps to grace, but all you'll know is what the mind makes of it, not the experience of grace itself. He goes on to say, grace comes from the sacred encounter with life. It's a realization that shifts your world to a softer, kinder trust in knowing all is well in the now. And what's unfolding is moving you in a perfect direction. Grace is life presenting itself. When you awaken to grace, there is a heightened perspective of the eternal verities revealing a masterpiece unfamiliar to you. In becoming aware of the potential of this holographic image, you sense the lure to merge with it. Grace. Do you believe that grace is always present? 
Do you believe that it's a possibility that grace is always giving itself to you? If that's a possibility, then what stands in the way of our experiencing grace? There's one of my favorite little songs as far as the lyrics, and it goes, slow down, everyone, you're moving too fast. Frames can't get you when you're moving like that. And then it goes on to say inaudible melodies, and it talks about what's going on all the time whether or not we see it, whether or not we hear it, whether or not we feel it, whether or not our hearts are open to it, whether or not we're experiencing it. In each moment, the mind and the body being can make a hell of the moment, right? We're pretty practiced at that. Or we can let go and go with the flow of the moment. There are films about this, right? If you, what was that film? A Beautiful Mind, the Holocaust film? Ah. Films about people in the most desperate of human conditions, in the depths of suffering, fully being overcome by grace. Grace does something that willpower couldn't touch. Grace does something that even our deepest forgiveness work couldn't come close to doing. Grace brings us from a space of duality into a true space of oneness, not intellectually, but through experience. And sometimes when we get moments of grace, we wonder how could it even be? How could it even be that I could release something like that and simply feel love? How could it be that I could heal something like this? How could it be that I could be worthy of this moment? Christian Sorensen goes on to talk about grace. And he says, on the heels of grace, wisdom enters and an almost indescribable clarity is known. Peace and harmony expresses itself in and through you. And there's an ineffable feeling of all is well with the world. Do you believe in the possibility of having that feeling when in the relative, it is far from that truth? Where in the relative, in your own life or globally, right, there's always going to be a reason to say not all is well, but all is hell. Really. Whether it's a diagnosis, whether it's depression, whether it's a family circumstance, something internal, something external, whether it's global threats of war, whatever it is, fill in the blank. But we dance between metaphysics and mysticism in this body being. We dance between reason and the flow of life. He goes on to say, surely you would know it as we have all known grace. The question is, when it showed itself, were you aware and did you observe it in its right action? When it showed itself, were you aware? Rumi said, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Grace. But many of us and most of us don't feel like we swim, move, and have our being in grace. We experience the human condition. We have empathy and compassion that sometimes can bring us to our knees and break our hearts open. We get stuck in our stories, and in fact, we repeat them long after the experience is happening. 
We can even become aware and identify our own psyche and our own issues, but feel completely incapable of making the changes that need to happen in order to not live from them or recreate them. We have all these conditions around the human self that feel like we are caged or limited or lacking. We can often impair the flow of grace. Christian Sorensen talks about moments where we make ourselves unavailable to grace. He says that we get stuck in myopic views of the insignificant. Doesn't that sound terrible? <laughs> to think that we would spend any time stuck in myopic views of the insignificant. But do a quick freeze frame of your life. Run the movie of your life for two seconds and think about how much time you have spent stuck in the myopic views of the insignificant, right? The inventory, like I can see the truck piling up, the tires are blowing. <laughs> that's a gift of being an elder, I think. I think that's why grandparents say that being a grandparent is one of the most amazing things, because they have evolved past being stuck in the insignificant and they are fully attuned to moments of grace. In the highest state, that is. <laughs> hmm. <clears throat> Sometimes. Some. I'm not going to start making jokes. <laughs> he says that sometimes we miss grace because we disregard our true nature. We fall short of knowing who we are. He says that what happens when one has reached a sense of oneness is a lack of opposites. One enters a state of consciousness where there is a lack of opposites like Rumi talked about. It is within the scarcity of good and bad, right and wrong, black and white, that we awaken. But how often do we get stuck in black and white thinking, in right and wrong, in good and bad. Just notice the mind, notice the conversation going on in the mind and notice how often it is that we are in that level of conversation. Can we watch it? Can we flag it? Can we become aware of it so we can see, mm, I don't even need to be stuck in the insignificant details. The fact that my mind is rolling around the idea of right and wrong means that I am making myself unavailable to grace. Is that a choice I'd like to make agreements with? He talks about other factors that keep us from grace. And he says that we can get caught up in the world of form if your reference, your focus, is for the world of form, it's all flash and gossip. He says, then you'll find that neurotic impressions cut off your connection from the sacred. If you get caught up in flash and gossip, neurotic impressions cut off your connection from the sacred. He talks about what we admire, and when we admire something, we draw it to us, we become it. So what are we admiring? What are we admiring? Because admiring is using our power of love, and our love power is a magnetic field. It is a drawing field. It is a harmonizing field. So when I have something that I admire, I begin to actually harmonize my frequency to it. I begin to create a system where I am dancing with it, where I am flowing with it. I am becoming it, and it is becoming me. Are we mindful of what we admire? Or are we admiring consumerism? Are we admiring the things of form rather than spiritual substance, divine law, and true nature? Are we admiring the accumulation of the human and the worldly? 
We can cut ourselves off when we tell ourselves that there's not time for meditation or spiritual practice or the silence or sacred community or divine appointments. Have you ever missed divine appointments? If you're a songwriter or if you're an artist, you know very well the dangers of saying there's not time. Because you don't always get second chances to eavesdrop on the mind of God. Well, that's not true. You get second chances, third chances all the time. You get constant chances, right? But the moment that it comes through, you, you become so still so you can catch it. And another one will come along, but if you don't catch that one, if you don't seize that moment, if you don't grab the paintbrush, if you don't write the song and pick up the instrument, it begins to drift away. And who knows, maybe it's someone else's, someone that's listening. How do we cut ourselves off? We cut ourselves off, he says, by aiming for self-preservation rather than self-dissolution. When we allow ourselves to dissolve in a spiritual way, we open ourselves up because we loosen our identity, we loosen all the things of form, we loosen all of these ideas that create tunnels and tubes through which we see and we simply open them up so we can experience from 360 degrees, spiritually. But the mind and the ego, as we know for, from Eckhart Tolle's work, as we know from Deepak Chopra's work, as we know from Charles Fillmore's work, the ego is always striving to preserve itself its identity, it's striving to make meaning and build identities, it's striving to verify and validate injury, to build evidence, to build a case, always looking to build a case, always looking to defend. That impairs the flow of grace. Scripture talks about that as serving two masters. How do we make ourselves unavailable to grace? Disbelief. Lack of trust in the flow. He says you may slip into the fear of the temporal power, whether in the form of the physical intimidation or the malpractice of consciousness but we may slip into fear. False evidence appearing real rather than recognizing our power to trust. That trusting is part of one of the 12 powers. It's part of faith. It's that perceiving power of the mind linked with the ability to shape substance. It's not something that happens to us. It is something that is generative. He says that we cut ourselves off from the flow when we engage in the mind that insists upon reasoning. If we're always looking for reasons, if we're always looking for why, if we always need it to make sense, if we always need a formula, if we're always looking for a critical eye to cut something apart and show why it's not good enough, why it's wrong, what's missing, or why it happened, how you can do it, how someone else can get it. But when we stay in the paradigm of reasoning, we are experiencing the one moment, and we only have the one moment, friends, don't we? All the time. It is only this moment. This moment right here, all of us together, right here. This is the only moment of existence right now. Is it enough to be fully present to? Is it enough to call it whole? If we have a mind desiring or requiring explanations for things, Think about what we might miss. Think about what we might miss.
grace. is what comes when we get something at the core of our being, even though all evidence in front of us points to the contrary. Someone said quite some time ago, in spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. In spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. Do you know who said that? Anne Frank. Can you feel that? Can you really feel it? In spite of everything, I believe people are really good. at heart. Have you bought into the idea that they're not? (laughs) Who's known for saying they like animals more than people? (laughs) Got a little club. If Anne Frank can say that in the depth of her being from the bottom of her soul she knows that people are really good at heart can we check ourselves can we open up to the possibility that there's another view that would bless us and bless our world Can we stop drinking the Kool-Aid that tells us separation is real, darkness is real, that the awful is real? And can we start believing and experiencing the truth even in the midst of those very real experiences. So what can we do? Christian Sorensen talks about how grace is not something like the other aspects of the spiritual practice, especially in unity. We talk a lot about what we can do, don't we? We talk about being vigilant with your mind. We talk about checking your thoughts at the door. We talk about making agreements and being conscious of that which we want to make agreements with. We talk about an active forgiveness practice. But he says that if we try to get more grace, sometimes it eludes us. If we try to pull it in, if we beg for it, We sometimes miss it. We don't see it. But what can we do to create a space that makes us available to it? Clearly, daily meditation and sitting in silence, clearly emptying yourself. But he has some other ideas. He says, look around to find the spaces where you can take the higher road. Look around to find the spaces where you can take the higher road. Can you make that part of your spiritual practice? Can I make that an active part of my mind and who I am? That I will slow myself down enough to get out of a pain body, to get out of an experience of needing to defend me, to get out of my own sense of what my own needs are, and ask for, watch for, and seek the higher road. He says that we can operate through kindness rather than defending and attacking. He says, when someone says something offensive to you, grace responds with kindness spontaneously rather than the natural human reaction of defending and attacking. 
Can we allow ourselves to soften into kindness? And then he says something that you may not expect. In order to become the space for grace to have its home within you. He says, do what you love. Do what you love with an abandoned passion. And without a shadow of a doubt, you will feel grace as it gives you the full experience of life moving through you. Grace lies in going full out for what your spirit must express. Being true to this is where the ultimate fulfillment lies. How lucky is that for us? Do what you love. Follow your heart with authenticity and abandon. He says, the motion of life operates through your consciousness. You are the activity of life, and your success and experience of grace will come when you allow yourself to be an instrument of truth by simply being authentic. Have you ever had such an easy answer? Being authentic. He says, you were born as a living animated avenue for grace to express for humanity. Namaste.